Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Jim Forster, certified consulting meteorologist and Forbes contributor. Jim, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Brittany. Good to be here. It's good to be talking with you because this is a problem that is impacting the entire country. We have seen extreme temperatures coast to coast. So just how hot has it been? It, it has, uh, as you pointed out, coast to coast has been the, the, the biggest factor, uh, and it has been very hot, particularly in uh, areas of the southwest United States. It's, it's been hot all across the southern United States, but the, the core of the heat has been really from Arizona through West Texas for about the last two weeks. Um, and then it started to expand a little bit more towards Florida, but over there it's a little bit more of a combination of the heat and humidity. The real heat, uh, the blistering heat, uh, is centered around the Phoenix area and Las Vegas and that part of the Southwest US. You used the term blistering. I've heard excessive heat. We're only in July right now. We still have a long ways to go until the end of summer. Is there relief in sight for these areas in particular? Uh, unfortunately, it's the wrong time of year to be looking for relief from, from heat. It's, it's the hottest area of the United States to begin with, of course, this time of year. Um, and then you throw in uh, some other climate factors. It's hard to break that down um, really until you start to get some moisture out there uh, later in the late summer. So there really is no end in sight. It may, we may talk about a little more shift a little bit back and forth, like into Texas and Oklahoma a little bit more, and then it might shift back, but it really isn't going anywhere um, for any time, um, any in the near future, certainly weeks out, uh, it's not going anywhere. And that's, you know, we can look out pretty accurately when it comes to patterns like this to see what it would take to break them down. And we're just not seeing anything to, unfortunately, to break it down. Uh, like I said, it might shift a little, but uh, a lot of people are going to be still experiencing excessive heat. And well, you asked, like, you know, there's been a lot of terminology around to try and describe this, but you know, uh, taking Phoenix, for example, we've talked about that a couple of times. Their all time high uh, that they've had, it was twice. They had it in 1990, you know, quite a while ago, and 2013, a, a bit ago, uh, 122. Um, they've had like two or three days at 120. Uh, so they haven't, while they haven't broken these records necessarily in a place like Phoenix, having so many days in a row um 21 days i believe they're at now above 110 that's just really hard to imagine so it's that lack of a break that that they're just not getting and then so many of those days that are in this heat wave are are right up there you know near all-time record highs uh whether or not it's 122 or 120 really doesn't you know doesn't negate uh the the effects that it's having um and it's even at night i i believe uh, phoenix is at a dozen days in a row now where it's above 90. so that's that's a problem you know usually we cool off at night and we think of oh it'll be hot tomorrow but even at night there's there's little relief um so that's what's making it so so horrible um these these temperatures maybe aren't all time but they're not going anywhere and they've already been there for weeks. I've been in the Northeast in my entire life, both Pennsylvania and currently in New York now. So I can't really imagine or wrap my head around double digit days where it's over 110 degrees. Is this lack of a break, what you were describing, is that normal for this time of year or is this a special circumstance? No, that's clearly what's the, the, the longevity of it, um, unfortunately, is unprecedented. And, you know, we're talking about the U.S., but the scope of it is also unprecedented. It's happening on three continents simultaneously. Um, uh, so that's where you start to scratch your head a little bit. You know, it, it's supposed to be hot in Phoenix and Las Vegas, but not 120 for two weeks in a row. Uh, and, and that, you know, we're seeing more frequent 
heat waves and more intense heat waves unfortunately at the same time you know that that's a that's what makes this uh it has it's not like it's been cool um uh, you know for for a while and as these patterns lock in we saw it last winter the pattern locked in all winter with snow in california it wiped out 20 years of drought in a in a year uh, unfortunately this is a, a hot pattern that's locking in for months and there's um these are happening more frequently and getting a little bit more intense all the storms are you wrote a piece for forbes about the economic impacts of this blistering heat and you you pulled out a really eye-popping number you said it could cost the u.s economy a hundred billion dollars a year can you break that down for us yes that's a lot of that is is health care costs uh, that were referenced in there um, there is the obvious the more heat there is and the more people in in marginalized communities that are you know suffering from it they just can't turn on the air conditioning and like maybe you or i could um or, or they don't have it uh you know it doesn't exist in in the facility or the housing that they have um there's a lot of emergency room visits that start to happen where um EMTs that are normally, you know, maybe fighting fires are, are doing double duty emergency, you know, uh, going out and trying to, to help people. Um, and a lot of those folks are, are um, admitted to the hospital with very serious conditions. Heat is one of the, the number one killers. And this is the reasons why it's, it's very hard to cool yourself down when your the physical processes um, don't work. And um, so you're going to have more ambulatory, more emergency room visits, more things like that, that are going to uh, cause cost. I don't know if you've been to the emergency room, but th those are expensive visits and they, they don't just throw you back out. Uh, you're there, you know, often for, for a bit of time. And then there's other uh, uh, cooling centers and having to make water available everywhere, even though it may be a shortage, um, you know, at public events, there's an obligation that you're going to keep people safe. Used to be lightning and storms. And now people are just as concerned or more concerned about the heat uh, part of it. Uh, it was earlier this summer. It was people, you know, having problems at, at concerts. Uh, so building cooling centers, um, um, shade areas, even some communities have done that are shaded and they have misting fans um, because air conditioners just don't work effectively outside. And uh, these all are, are unplanned costs, certainly, and, and ones that is hard for a community to just ignore because there's lives at, at risk. It doesn't just, you know, go away it's it's not uh it's it's really bad it's we see p pictures of floods that have inundated communities you know for weeks after an event that's kind of what a heat event is but you just don't see the damage it's it's there and and um it, it really it adds up especially with the health care costs um, and and that's um the more people that are exposed to it, uh, the worse that they're going to be impacted by it. So healthcare costs are the bulk of that $100 billion number, but you also mentioned infrastructure is in there as well. Can you break that down for us? Certainly, yes, there's uh, even where I am here, I, th I think our high temperature so far this year has only been in the low 90s. We only hit 100 here on average every three or four years in in uh, in Minneapolis. So it's pretty rare. Um, we had pavement buckling. It, it just I didn't even know it was a, a, a phenomena, uh, to be honest with you. And then I started reading up on it and I I shouldn't smile. I realized it happens quite a bit, particularly down in Texas. There was quite a few events that I I cited in my article around the Houston area. And uh, our uh, our company has customers that almost every state you, you drive over them all the time but you don't know it there's sensors in the road that provide primarily information for winter maintenance um again this is where we've gotten into with with the uh challenges changing from just winter to now also summer they also measure 
pavement temperatures. Um, so they know what chemicals to put down in the winter, but they know how hot it is in the summer. And, you know, pavement temperatures can get well above 100, 120 or more um, on, a, on a very hot day with a high sun angle like we have, you know, this time of year. And there's a, a combination of, of moisture or the lack of it and heat that can cause pavements to buckle. And these aren't just potholes that they go out and fill. It, it can sometimes take days for um for something like that to get repaired and if it happens on a major artery in a in a major metropolitan area um it can cause just just chaos um and uh so those are the things that you know you don't expect to happen uh, you can't forecast them but they're happening more frequently in these extreme type cases that we're talking about um, and um, so that's another example of, of infrastructure type costs, uh, having to make sure, you know, like right now, if a, a water pumping station uh, needs maintenance or needs replacement, perhaps it's, it's come up to its life. Um, and um, as part of an infrastructure uh, upgrade, a community would say, all right, we need a new water pumping station. Well, they're gonna build it for a lot more rain uh, potentially than they maybe the one 35 years ago was built when we weren't having just incredible rainfall rates that we're seeing uh, like last week up in the Northeast, um, just like two months of rain in three hours. Um, that didn't happen 35 years ago or we would have had pumps that were ready for that kind of stuff. So communities have to think more about the future and not just assume, well, I'll never have a flood here because it's never flooded. Um, I don't, you know, how many floods they've had in upper, you know, parts of Vermont, uh, northern Vermont and New Hampshire. But I, I bet they're thinking a little bit more about that, you know, now. And other communities are probably saying, wow, uh, last year there was floods in Detroit, Omaha, uh, you know, not just places along the coast where everybody says, well, it always floods. Um, so oddities are happening in more of, you know, more places than they maybe would have earlier. And it is forcing communities to think differently when they're planning for 50 years or 100 years from now. You hear the term like a 100 year flood. Th that means on in climatologically, it, it would be happening once every 100 years, of course. Well, you know, we had like four or five of those last year. We had two of them last week. Um, so we have to kind of redefine what a hundred year flood might be. And, and our chance isn't, you know, one in a hundred. It's, it's perhaps quite a bit more than that. And uh, these extreme, uh, they're, they're low probability, high impact events. So they, they hardly ever happen, but when they do, they are catastrophic. Um, and we've seen a couple of them, the heat as we're talking about, but the floods, oh my goodness, that was, you know, the roads are still washed out, they're gone. Uh, they have to rebuild them or decide not to rebuild them because of the same reasons I just, uh, you know, I just said. So it's forcing uh, communities, states, um, everybody to rethink uh, or think more about these extremes. They're there has been cycles in, in, in certainly in weather, but there's been a lot more of these and there's a lot of people living in, in the United States. And it's hard to ignore the fact that they are going to happen next year and the year after and the year after. They're just not going to all of a sudden, you know, go away. Um, so we used to talk a lot about El Nino and how how these things were all linked. Now it seems like we have chaotic weather no matter what's going on and you know we haven't even talked about the fact that the oceans are have we don't even know what's going on there right now they're so off the charts parts of them not not the whole oceans but um so a lot of these things are puzzling and and it's harder to ignore them from what you're saying it sounds like these are happening in more places and more frequently 
And you made an interesting point that communities need to reframe their thinking here a bit on how to prepare the infrastructure costs, things like that. So how do communities prepare? What should they do? Uh, they, if they're going to rebuild a freeway, uh, they're probably going to build it above a thousand year flood plain, not a hundred year flood plain, for example. Uh, if you're like, there's a lot of rivers around where I live, uh, one of them very big, the Mississippi, um, it, it, it's not likely to flood. It's a huge river, it's got giant banks, but there's other rivers that are not like that and and uh, they spread out when there's flooding. That, it, you know, they, they uh, and that happens a lot. And um, so things like that, um, are going to force us to maybe rethink how we build uh, future infrastructure. Like I said, if a road washes out due to a flood, maybe it's not the right thing to put the same road back where the same one was because it might flood again. Um, so uh, they did that last year at Yellowstone when there was some uh, problems out there when they rebuilt the roads they didn't build them where they were before they built them in a different area because you know they they learned some lessons out there so i think it'll force communities maybe when they build a new road they make sure that they have a, a proper drainage for uh increased rainfall rates that's also a thing that's happening a lot more it, it might not be raining that much over if you look at a year statistics, but if you got two months of it in three hours, you kind of lose that. And it was like, well, it was an average year, but it wasn't an average year for those two or three days. It was horrible. You know, there was flooding and and, and everything else. So those are the kind of things um, it would affect where you build your power plants. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of them are along rivers and stuff. Well. Maybe, you know, maybe that needs to be rethought because that rivers flood. And, and um, so this flooding is a, a big problem for communities, river flooding and uh, flash flooding. So they're two different things, um, but they're both on the increase and they're both extremely costly when they happen. Um, so you want to do your best to, you, know, you, you don't want to put a condo complex in a floodplain where you're probably going to have a lot of explaining to do. Um, whereas 50, 100 years ago, it's what's what are the odds, you know, and that's unfortunately houses are sliding into, you know, the ocean in California. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we, you know, we, we build in a fire area, we build in floodplains. Well, we, we have to be sensible about where we put infrastructure and maybe think think the worst rather than the best. Jim, we've talked about Jim. two extreme events, excessive heat as well as flooding, and they seem like they're on two separate ends of the spectrum here. As a meteorologist, what's more concerning to you, the flooding or the extreme heat? Uh, the extreme heat because it just affects so many more people. Um, it, it's the spatial area is thousands of miles, uh, you know, with all due respect to the to the folks up in New England there. Uh, that was a relatively focused event, horrible event, um, but it didn't affect like New York City, uh, for example, just not not too far away up, you know, just northwest of it. And then uh, it didn't affect like you know, Connecticut that much, but it devastated Vermont. The heat wave is bad from really California, Nevada, uh, all the way through Texas, certainly, uh, even Louisiana. And then you mentioned uh, some areas of Florida. Uh, that's, you know, a lot of people. And uh, you, there's, you know, you, you don't leave for a heat wave, like you maybe leave for a flood or, you know, you hide in your basement for a tornado. You're stuck uh, with a heat wave. There's nowhere to go. And particularly, and you, you know, you can't ignore um, a lot of people don't have the housing that, that you know, you know, we take for granted, but it's not necessarily a, a homeless issue. Last year up in the Northwest United States, where some of this heat might start shifting in a couple of weeks, Seattle area, they don't have air conditioning. 
in their houses because it was never hot enough. They didn't, it didn't justify like in the Northeast, you of course have air conditioning and I have it here. Well, that's another example of how communities may start thinking differently uh, and require air conditioning to be in public housing. I probably would, no matter where I was building it these days, because you can't assume it's not going to get hot. Um, so those are, you know, those are the ways we have to learn, um, and 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 maybe, like I said, not be so optimistic. But you know, you don't want to hide from all the weather. But it is happening in in places it didn't used to happen, which has to raise awareness. And how do you raise awareness there? Because you know, there's two camps here where people are focused on climate and then there might be people that aren't as focused on this. So how do you raise that awareness? Yeah, that's a really good question, Brittany. Um, part of, of being in the in the weather business, it, it used to be, you know, providing accurate forecasts. That's, that's you know, it, I guess that probably makes sense. Um, but a, a lot of places have accurate forecasts today. Your phone has some accurate forecasts right now on it. Uh, you can look at pretty radars, you can watch, you know, television and, and they're usually pretty good. Our National Weather Service is, is there to save our lives every day, does a fantastic job. More and more people want to know what to do um, because they have all this information and maybe more than they could ever imagine. And, but somebody said, don't ever let anything bad happen in your community or I'm gonna blame you. Um, so they said, you know, uh oh, I better figure out what that means because I'm gonna get blamed and I don't know anything about weather. So a part of the weather business now has evolved into, we call it risk uh, communication. That starts with risk assessment. We, we would sit down with a community, a customer, a giant airport, um, a sports league, anybody that's trying to manage something that is big or, or you know, has a lot of visibility and um, kind of assess where the risk points are that they have. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, heat uh, problems this summer in the Northeast because there's not going to, it's going to be a cool, relatively cool, like, like you've experienced in the Northeast. Um, and it's going to be hot in the Southwest. So, you know, bring all your bottles of water, you know, for your sporting events down there. It's not that simple, but we do a risk assessment of where the points of concern should be. And then we work with the customer to make sure that those are the points that are being met with weather forecasts, rather than just saying, here's a lot of really accurate numbers and some, some very good pictures, um, you know, good luck. Uh, that, that, the the where there's a lot of risk or um uh safety risk financial risk or you know fiduciary risk or safety there's almost always a, a level of consultation going on that starts with what should i care about all i hear about is mayhem you know floods and, and tornadoes and you know, all right, settle down. There's no tornadoes happening right now, in you know uh, this this month, uh, for instance, in, in you know in Michigan, um, um, and we we help them understand what's important, so they can get back to whatever they're trying to manage and do that, and only care about the weather when they know something is going to cause them an issue. And that's really how we raise the awareness with with folks uh, uh because you know we get a chance to talk about um one in a hundred year floods well what does that mean everybody's heard it uh, you know or or this is a millennial event well you know what does that mean um so we try and turn the a lot of the terminology into actionable insight what does it mean for me uh, and that's what's expected these days at the level that you know that that we work at with with a lot of our risk communication jim forrester i really appreciate all of your insights thank you so much for joining me today thank you very nice to be here Brittany.